Hi everybody, here we are back again in the Woodworking Wisdom Workshops. My name's Colin Way, and today is all about having a bit of fun on the lathe. So it's spaceships. And if uh, your, um, your comments are anything to go by, I think you're all ready and prepared for this one. This is about fun on the lathe. This is about having, having a laugh. It's about getting kids involved as well. Um, and we've all turned so many bowls by now, I'm sure, that you just want to give something else a go. And if you're bored one evening, something like this is, is a bit of a laugh. So we're going to walk through the thought process of making or recreating one of your favorite ships um, or even making something up. Um, what they use for? Paperweights, I guess. Something nice to look at, a bit of a talking point, a bit of fun. Um, but next week, we're going to take what we're doing today, as in the different spaceships, and we're going to turn them into a mobile. So something you can hang on the ceiling. So think about what we're doing and downscaling it size-wise. And we're going to talk about doing that in a moment. Um, and uh, yeah, so it's just about ideas. And a lot of this is going to be then down to you to, to make some of these shapes. I'm going to go through the different ones that I've, that I've started with that I've been um, doing this week. Some of the ones I've, I've already... Uh, so you would have seen before from, from models I've made before. Um, and we'll discuss painting and all those sorts of things. So we'll go through those and then we'll talk about creating one today and, um, and like I say, the thought processes. So we've got Ben on cameras, on questions on everything. Okay, so we're going to uh, ask questions uh, to Ben. He'll relay them to me. You know how it works. Same sort of form as normal. So let's start with a, a fairly simple one, a, a nice recognizable uh, rocket shape. And um, Ben's just going to, we're going to look at these overhead just because it's a nicer way of looking at the actual form. So look, I mean, basically anything that we can turn around, we can turn into a ship of some sort. So there we are, a nice simple dome shape. The way I've done this one, there's a little hole in the back end of the engine there, so it's a mortise and tenon basically, um, and that then can be used on a drive centre as well once you've drilled the hole. So rough the cylinder down, hold it in your chuck, drill a hole, invert it, use that as a drive, and then just clean off that end bit when you're done. Okay, and a few bits of plywood. Plywood is quite important to model making. Um, this is just standard ply but i use a lot of birch ply um, and we're going to use birch ply today there's nice thin birch if you're unsure about where to get birch ply i go online i just do the search i'll put three mil birch or six mil birch um, ply in, and then you get loads and loads of places okay don't have to buy big sheets you can buy from certainly for model making you can buy it in small say one foot by two foot sheets so it's nice and easy to handle so there's our our first little rocket i don't know Buck Rogers back in the uh, back in the fifties, forties, fifties. I think it was the old black and white Buck Rogers, very recognisable spaceship. Let's go to something a little bit more modern, so something more factual rather than fiction. Here we are, some, and then we're going to do a couple of these for next week's mobile. We're going to do a little Saturn um, figure, so a little uh, planet for our um, our satellites to go around. These do look far better painted, and the lovely thing with these is a very simple piece of turning, just a, again, addition of some plywood. But when you start at, um, adding other materials to it, like foil and stuff like that, it becomes really realistic. And it's down to you how far you go with your model making or how realistic you want them to be or how abstract that you want them to be is your thing. It's entirely up to you. Like I say, this is just for fun. Um, again, we've probably got, I've got one, two, three pieces of turning there and two bits of ply. So it's, it's not a huge amount of, of wood waste either. These are scrap wood projects, by the way. You know, I'm not cutting up good stuff. This is all scrap wood projects. Great stuff for for those just times that you're a little bit bored with turning a bowl, like I say. Right, we're going to go straight to our movies next. So one of Ben's favorite he is the rather this all the dark side most of the time and he does like a good tie fighter so there we are a little tie fighter this, incidentally this is what we're going to be turning today a very very simple project um you can see that it's made up more i've actually made this up from three pieces of turning again two bits of ply so same as the the other one the additional bits of ply uh, are just these pieces look how simple that is so again we can downscale that quite easily um, into our tie fighter so that's going to be today's project let's go let's keep with the same moving let's go up to um, a falcon so again something that is instantly recognizable however 
I've been quite vague with the detail on this, and any real movie buffs will will be quite quick to jump on me. Uh, there's a lot of maybe not complete scale. There's a lot of things I haven't put on, but you know, look at the real thing. Um, they're very detailed, um, but this is just a representation. Incidentally, around here, this is um, the uh, Merica type abrasive. It's really right, quite good for for texture. Okay. We're just going to do a couple more, then I'm going to take one of Ben's questions. So we'll get rid of these models and then we'll go over. So let's go to a different movie now. So again, this is recognizable instantly. A lot of these figures are. Okay. And now we're going to look at some stills of this in a minute. I want to just show you the difference between um, an actual timber model and the instant change it has when you add, um, add paint. So Ben, could you pop to the first model, which, which is actually this one that we've got here in our hands. So there we are. So there's our model before. If you look at the, the engines there, we're using some, um, some acrylic for the engine um, uh, front and for the little disc. And we go to the painted version. Look how it springs to life immediately. Um, then once you get not only recognizable shapes, but recognizable colors as well, that really does help bring your turning to life. So there we are. With that, in mind, let's have a look at our final model here. Um, and this is not its true or correct color, um, but uh, this is a base color. I always tend to go gray to start with. It's just a priming color, just to take out the grain of the timber if I want to. Um, and then we can start spraying on the correct colors um, and really go into town if you want to do that. If you want to leave it abstract, don't bother painting it at all. Um, or paint it one color. But yeah, just a little bit of fun. Um, I probably won't do this one again for the mobile because there's a lot of pieces in this one. We're talking one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, 10, 11, 12, 13, and the main body, 14 pieces in that one. So a little bit more of a lengthy project. But if I'm on it, it's probably one of my favorites. Okay, yes, let's go for some questions then, Ben. So hello everybody. Um, first question here from Jenny. Um, do you have any tips on um, cutting the ply on the bandsaw without it splintering the edge? Uh, fine blade. So you can get 10 to 14 um, uh, TPI blades and that works really, really well. However, what I tend to do is cut to near the line and I'm talking probably about a sixteenth, about a mil and a half away from the line and then sand up to it. And that's one point. We're going to talk about this later on. The sanding table that I use on the lathe I've been using for, for years, and it does create a lot of interest. We're going to look at that, and it just literally goes in the, um, the banjo of the lathe with my sanding disc. So when we get to that point, let me show you, and, um, and, and hopefully that will help. But yeah, sand up to the line rather than cut right up to it. If you're cutting with, say, a three or four TPI blade, it will splinter quite badly, especially on the thinner um, plywoods. So yeah, go nice and fine. Um, it, to be honest, anything, once you start going above a six, it starts to improve dramatically. And like I say, 10 to 14, then you get a, a really good clean cut. I mean, there's nothing stopping you. You can do it on your scroll saw as well, even better, even, um, even finer. Okay. And Marie is just asking, is there any plans available? And there isn't Maria. No, this is all out of my, um, my weird head. Um, but let's talk about plans and welcome back, Maria. We missed you last week. Welcome back. It's nice to hear you, you're back with us. Um, let's have a look at plans. So this, I'm not an artist. You would have, I'm sure, picked that up by now. Look, sketches. And the reason I've got these sketches, these are based, or these are coming from for the mobile for next week, really. I want to do a satin in the middle, and I want to do all these sort of shapes around it. But all I've done from those sketches, before those sketches, I just went and looked for pictures. I look for things that I thought, well, we can turn them round. They could be, you know, I mean, it's round. Everything about it's round apart from the wings. Um, but, yeah, Movie Bus will very quickly pick up on a lot of these images. That's a non-fictional one there. So there we are, Discovery. Well, no, this is Challenger. Um, but look, round rockets, round, oh, sorry, round booster rockets, round main rocket there, and I'm sure... Like the um, the X wing we've done, we can make that from around quite easily. Maybe plywood for the wings, but you know, there's loads of loads of things out there, loads of ideas. So no, um, Maria, I've got no plans. Um, all I've done with those 
um, pictures, I've decided how big I want the model and I've measured that size. So let's say, for instance, I want a model, I don't know, what was it, this one, for instance. I've measured this um, and it's around about 180 millimeters. I just literally looked at size and guessed it. I then took the sheets that I've um, printed off and I've divided the, the actual length on the sheet um, by the size I wanted. That gave me a figure that I can then start multiplying by. And then I can keep scale the same on everything. So it's quite a nice way of working. Um, and I think it's about 1.5 I was working with. So on my piece of paper, I was upscaling everything by 1.5. Just had the calculator next to me and said, right, what's, what's one and a half times that sort of thing? And that's how we keep scale, um, you know, either going up or going back down again. All right, so a really simple way of working, nothing complicated. So I think we're going to start turning, unless you've got any questions, Ben. No, we're all good. Fantastic. So um, a very, very basic turning this one. I'm going to start with friction drives. There we are. And we're going to do this figure here. So this is our, our little TIE fighter. Okay, um, that is basically where we are. So that's our central piece there. That includes tenons because we're going to go through the side here on a tenon. Um, and it's a very, very small tenon because the material that I'm using for the wings in this case, okay, or not wings, I don't know what they're going to be called, but they're not wings as such. But this is only three mil. So I've got to do a 1.5 tenon because I'm going to come from the other side on 1.5 as well. Either that or go through all the way by several millimeters and do a mortise on your capping piece, on the piece that, that comes through here. And this is the other thing, you know, uh, I call these um, scrap wood projects, but they're also a great way of practicing work holding on the lathe. It's a uh, it's an exercise in figuring things out. How are we gonna hold that? How are we gonna get that finished sort of thing? And I quite like the challenge of that. So friction drives, because we're gonna create tenons, I don't want a big drive center in the way. Just lock him in, and this is nothing difficult. Honestly, this is not a tricky thing. All of the models we're doing just involve time, not uh, not difficulty at all. So you could be a big, complete beginner by your weekend this weekend, uh, by your lay this weekend, and start turning and make these no problems. Okay, we're going to turn quite quickly. So let's go up to around about two thousand revs, and we'll just go. With the roughing gouge initially, down to cylinder. There we are. Now, I'll stay with the same dimensions that we have on our one that we've already made. And I believe it's about 35 mil. Keep him there just for the minute. So parting tool. And then if we take the skew chisel, we'll just clean that surface up. Nice and close again. We just need to get down to that diameter. There we are. So down to the diameter that we need. Now we need to decide where halfway is. I don't want to mark it in any way, so I'm just going to get the rule. And we are on 80, oh, about 85 there. There we go. Right, so now I can start copying. Don't forget, if you're working from a picture, you're upscaling or downsizing, whichever you want to do. Um, so I'm going to go now with dividers because I have something to follow. And so first measurement, which I'm going to need to half, 
is is third that's neat so this 30 so a 15 each side there we are the other thing we can measure now if you look at my figure here so inside this first dome we've got a little flat area so we can measure the depth of that and that gives me somewhere to cut down to so again that'll be calipers I'm going to use the width of that parting tool. I'm going to keep it there while we cut the next diameter in. Let me try and do this so we can show you. I'm getting smaller and smaller. There literally is no difficult turning here. Same thing. Now, before I do anything else, I'm going to measure this inside surface. So this one right here. So I want to start roughing a few bits out, but I don't want to go down too small and get rid of that surface. So get the dividers, uh, sorry, the calipers, make your measurement. So there's that final diameter. Now, before again, before we go any further, what I'd like to do is create the tenon. We've got a lot to do still. We've got a curve to create. We've got a few chamfers to do. We've got a further reduction in diameter. But once we get to that smaller diameter, we may get a little bit of vibration happening. So I'm going to get the tenon going. Bearing in mind we're using a three mil, so about one eighth ply. I can't go over that. So we're going to stick quite small. Yes, Ben. So question in from Colin. Um, he says he's just got the trade 350 lay. Um, it's only been turning for the last month. Do they need to keep moving the belt setting? Yes. It's like gears on a car. Imagine driving to the supermarket in first gear. You're going to soon wear out your car. So gears on a car, gears on a bicycle, that sort of thing. Um, what you have is, a, um, is ratios. So if you're in um, low gear, you'll have a very powerful um, position of, of, on the belt, but it won't go very fast. If you're on high gear, it'll go really, really quickly, but you're not going to get a lot of power. And this the variation in between that. So if you're turning small things, go fast, but without the power. If you're turning big things, lock it right down so you can't go too fast, but you get a lot more power to, to um, the piece. So, yeah, absolutely. They are gears. All right. So I'm just measuring the drill bit that we use to drill the wings out with. You'll know, Ben, were they wings, foils? What are they on a TIE fighter? Someone to know out there. <laughs> Now, 
There we are. That's enough. So now we can start putting in the rest of the definition. I'm going to start off by just rounding over this central piece. So there we are, bead practice without realizing it. A little bit of a chamfer on this next flat area. Now in wood turning terms, those flat areas are called fillets. So if you wanted to know, they're fillets. And now we're gonna to go to a parting tool again. Measure diameter one more time. go that'll be it just take out the last little bits of waste chance to use the skew so i'm just putting a little chamfer in here we still got a further one to do I'll take the parting tool just to flatten that off. And there we are. We have the center of our tie fighter. Let's pop this together. Now, obviously, we can sand that. I'm not going to sand. You don't need to see me sit, um, sit here and sand. Um, but basically, there's that first shape that way. Okay, I'm going to put those straight into the wings just because I want to check to make sure that I've got the right size on the tenant. Okay, one's a little loose. My mistake there. But look, already it's recognizable just from that simple shape. We're going to make it even more recognizable. We're going to put the front... Um, Front window, I guess. I'm going to put one of these in. And it gets to a point where you're starting to come up with the shapes. You know, we, we look at the, the, um, the inspiration to start with the pictures, but then you create whatever shape you want. So let's go with, we're going to use another bit of tulip for that. It's tulip, incidentally, is the main timber that I'm using, only because it's not full of too much heavy grain. Um, it turns really nicely. And I can get a crisp edge from it. So it's sort of my chosen timber for a lot of things. That or lime is another good one. Sycamore is a good one. As long as it's good sycamore and it hasn't gone too far, hasn't been drying for too long and got too um, too dry. But good, good sycamore is great for it. Um, and we're going to just pop a chuck on there. Clear a few things. Now, I'm not governed by any size restraints now so what chuck shall we use so i'm gonna let's go with that bit of timber we're gonna rough it down first let's go slightly bigger actually we'll rough it down first and then we'll hold it in a chuck 
So just do a cylinder. Then you've got options. You can use that in any chuck. So I could put that in a seed jaw. I could put that in, um, for instance, these are great jaws for, these are the soft jaws. These are fantastic jaws for, for model makers. They're a little bit like engineering jaws, but aluminium, soft edged. Okay, so they're, they're quite good for holding pieces. My favorite O'Donnell jaws are great. Um, an O'Donnell. OD, I think most of you know what an OD jaw is by now. You know, they just throw everything a little bit further away. Okay, I'm going to rough this down. I'll probably put it in the O'Donnell jaws as well, um, just because they're set my favorite. So let's rough this down to a cylinder. I only need to do one of the side plates for you. You don't need to see it done too many times. There we are. Tighten everything up. Speed is the same. Rough it down like we have done everything else. And the other thing, if we're going to rough it down, we may as well clean up one edge. This applies to pretty much any project that, that you're doing. If you're going to rough a piece down and you're going to eventually hold it in the chart, just clean up that bearing surface, otherwise it can be thrown out of, out of sync, thrown out of being true. But there we are. Now, if you're going to do a few of these, get all your blanks ready. Rough them down. Um, and it just means it sort of saves you from taking centers out, chucks, putting chucks on and all that sort of thing. So we'll just remove that one. Um, I'm going to go to the O'Donnell jaw, so I just need to add those to one of the chucks. And if I take out, I'll take out this big set of jaws and replace it. So ever so easy to replace jaws. If you don't have the lock screw, and the, uh, certainly all the Axmits chucks have a lock screw nowadays. Um, so you can remove that lock screw to remove the whole set of jaws if you want to. Have a look at your user manual. Or, I'll ex or go to the product page because we've got some good um, information and videos on how to change jaws and lock screws and all those sorts of things. And we're going to start now. Got to put jaws in order. So one to four. I get them in order first. Let's get rid of our old jaws. So the way we're going to do this, I'm going to find slot number one there. I'm going to look for the beginning of the scroll. You can't see this. I'm just explaining it, all right? But there are lots of videos on how to do this. Look for the start of the scroll. Put number one jaw in. Wind the scroll to the next slot. Make sure that's grabbed. Number two. And just repeat the process all the way around. Do I see a question there, Ben? Yes, yeah, so we've got a question here from Fuller. Um, is there a U.S. distributor? Uh, there are several centers and chuck jaws uh, that, are not, that are not commonly available in the U.S. Yeah, no, absolutely there is. So we've got um, uh, the woodturningstore.com um, in New York. If you go online to the woodturning store, you'll have a whole range of chucks. They um, uh, mail all over the U.S., so you go to those guys. If you're fortunate enough to be watching people like Nick Agar, um, then he's one of our ambassadors. He, he'll be demonstrating the, the chucks constantly. So, yeah, just keep your eyes peeled. I know recently they were at, uh, uh, they were being demonstrated at, at Swap Meet, um, AAW. Well, I was demonstrating at the AAW. But, yeah, loads and loads of places. But um, if you want to buy, go straight to the woodturningstore.com. And, like I say, they'll have the whole range there. There we are. So I'm going to get the bowl gouge out next. We'll just tidy up. I'm doing a skew cut, so just cleaning up, just like as if my bowl gouge were a skew. So I'm presenting at 45 degrees-ish and cleaning up. At the moment, the diameter of that piece is far too big. So let me just work out how big we want it. I'm going to go down to... Whatever that is, let's have a look. So we're down to an inch ish, roughly. Partington. There we 
we are. Whilst I'm there, I'm just going to see how much bigger those little um, side bits are. Do you know, I'm going to keep them the same as the window, just for ease. The trouble with doing things like this, I've already mentioned, these are scrap wood projects. And the trouble with scrap wood projects means you never end up throwing anything away. Right, and let's do a window. So what shape are we doing, roughly? Um, Going to make this up as we go. So we need to clean that face up first. parting tool. Again, you would need to sand that before you part off, but I'm going to carry on and just sand straight off. There we are. Now we have on the back just a little lip. Let me just get you a bit closer in. Yeah, so we do have a little lip there. However, that will sand that off in a moment. I'm going to do one of the side panels now for the side of the wing. So this one just here. And then we can start working on assembly. And we're going to discuss glues as well, because glue is going to be really important for this. I said I'm not going to do everything. We might as well. We've got plenty of time. Always clean up first because that will be ragged. The thing, the trouble with a parting tool, parting tools are fantastic at doing the job, but they don't cut. They'll rake the grain away. So end grain will be torn when you use it. That's why you'll see me always going in with the skew and just pairing off. Put the camera to a minute, Ben. You see the action there, just pairing off. Okay. Now I'm going to size to the hole. Remember, this is the drill hole that I'm sizing now. There we are. So that's okay. We can do any shape we want to on the outside face. And again, you're going to sand before parting off. I'll do this one, and then we'll move on to number number two. Oh, that's too big. Let's go smaller. And I'm going to do one more of those. Yes, Ben. Um, so I think you kind of answered it, but Maria says when she cuts off like that, she always ends up with um, torn end grain. Um, how can she avoid it? Um, with, uh, with the parsing tool, with the skew. With the skew. Um, okay, you're probably just using the tip of the tool then in that case, Maria. Um, what you need to do is start with the tip, but very quickly lift the handle and start now cutting with the main section of cutting edge. So the tip isn't engaged. I'm probably around about sort of two or three mil above the tip. And that uh, that will really give you a lovely clean finish. All right. And Bill, uh, sorry, Bill's just asking what um, timber was it? Uh, tulip, Bill. Tulip wood. So just get that tannin going again. There we are. That's enough. Mm 
we are. Again, sand, you want to, and part off. Okay, so on all of these pieces, we've got a little tiny nib that we need to clear away. Okay, so I'm going to do that next. We're not going to have that with the lathe running. They, these pieces are far too small, and the only thing that will happen is either I'll sand my fingernails away um, or the piece will end up down the dust extractor. So I'm going to do it static. Yes, Ben? Right, so, so when Maria was asking about parting off uh, with the parting tool, Oh, yes, you will get that, Maria. The parting tool, like I say, it just rasps the timber away, so always clean up then with the um, with the skew. You can, if it's not a particularly soft timber, you can refine the cut. If you give you resharpen the, the parting tool and then use the top edge, so instead of the front face, use the top edge. So just tilt the parting tool into all the timber a fraction, just a little bit. And that'll scrape, shear scrape, as you go in. So that'll help clean and minimize any of that breakout uh, at all. Sort of supports the timber as it's going. Okay. Be better on dense timbers, but it, it does work. It does improve the cut on everything. There we are. So we're just going to take this one out. We're going to put some C jaws in. go so C jaws and we're going to use our sanding disc now we haven't used the table yet I want to show you the table because if you've been watching from the start from the start of woodworking wisdoms and turning from my workshop and all those sorts of things I would have used this sanding table an awful lot the links are below the video so you can have a look. Now, the sanding table is part of the Axminster um, tool rest system. Okay, so this is your, your main uh, uh, tool post for the tool rest system. This is actually sold as a carving head for, to attach your carving, carvings um, and carve them in the stability of the banjo of the lake, which is a great idea. However, it also makes a great platform to attach um, a sanding table. And this is a piece of, of MDF, high density, M, uh, so it's not MDF, it's high density uh, fiberboard with uh, this, this is like a melamine um, top, so nice and slippy as well. Um, I've also used the um, limiting collar. So this is, I've got this set to center point on the sanding disc. So all I have to do now, just slide that down, lock it in, and then we'll have a nice sanding disc um, or sanding machine now, uh, into converting the lathe into a sander. Um, so that enables me then to sand up to my lines. When we were talking earlier about sanding, um, you know, look how easy that sands up to those lines. Okay, it's nice and flat. It's nice and flat on the table, so you've got a true 90 degrees. It's nice and safe also. Dust extractor obviously is key here. Um, we don't want to too much dust in the air. However, using a sanding table with these little fellas here just wouldn't work. So all I do is either on or off the lathe, just do that by hand. I'm in control and that little pip has disappeared. Yes, Ben. Um, so a question from Frederick. Um, does a hooked parting tool make a better job than a normal diamond shaped one? A hook parting tool, I think as soon as you start getting into like the bead forming tools, things like that, then yeah, they do create a much better finish. And you'll find thinner parting tools will. As soon as you go down to a 16th, um, they'll give you a slightly better finish. And a sh to be completely honest with you, a sharp parting tool makes a difference. We're all the same. You know, my parting tool could have done with a, a bit of a sharpen. But if you want the best finish possible, do a, 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 sh a fresh sharpen then do your finishing cut and the tilt very slightly in. And when I say tilt, I mean literally only just off of upright, just enough for the top face to, to have a very slight uh, scrape as well. And that'll give you the best finish possible. There we are. Right. I'm going to take the platform out because I don't want to get glue on it. I'm using two glues for these models. I use one to weld and one to, one to fix. So a lot of the um, surfaces that we're joining here, um, 
they're very small. Okay, so I'll use, for instance, let's grab a model. Um, so here, here, so let's go with this one. So this is a butt joint. There's no tenon, no mortise going on here. It's just pure butt joint. So first of all, there is a very slight curve, which I try and sand in to get the best, boss, best possible join um, uh, that you could. Imagine welding. You know, For instance, you want the best join. You want it nice and flush. And then what I'll do is I'll use um, a, 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 a CA-type glue. So in this case, it's the type bond CA. Okay, That will give me an instant grip. And just a dab, like spot weld. So just a dab here and there, and you can add a little bit of the accelerator for an instant bond. Accelerate to one surface, glue to the other, as long as you know exactly where it's going, because as soon as it touches, it's, it's, it's gripped. But then for your long-term weld, you want to be able to use, I tend to go for epoxy, Z-poxy. You know, this is a five-minute one. It does exactly what it says. It's five minutes, and you're going to start getting a really, really firm weld. For any of the big surfaces, fantastic. Uh, like I say, for those small surfaces where you just butt joint in, use that spot weld of the CA, but then the main um, the main addition of your epoxy um, glue. And that really, really works well. It's incredible how strong that epoxy is. You know, it, it, the, the wood will break before the glue join does in a lot of cases. Um, these are models at the end of the day. They're not going to be, well, hopefully they're not going to be thrown around or anything like that. They stand on a shelf or they hang from the from the ceiling. So they shouldn't be given too much pressure. So let's take these to one side. I'm not going to glue up because what I know what I'll end up doing, if I'm trying to glue up quickly in front of you, um, I'll end up gluing my fingers to something. Um, but one thing I need to do here, so this, this is go back to our model, so our little TIE fighter. I'm going to turn the dust extractor on. Rather than just gluing our little window here to the front face, we're going to sand a flat. Okay, sand a flat that that can bed into. It looks like it's sunk in then. So just a little bit of extraction. We'll turn our, turn our flat. Sand our flat, rather. that can fit on there. It's joined up really nice and tight now. So I know what I said, but let's just dab a little bit of this on. I won't use the epoxy because it's five minute epoxy. It's going to take a little bit too long to dry. Put that on, put that on and just leave that there for two seconds. The amount of times I've glued my fingers to projects. And then, is that going yet? That's pretty good. We've got one tight fixing, one loose. So the loose one, look, I'm going to pop a little bit of that in. Spray a little bit of that on the top. That's caught. Then we're going to get our... That one over the top, do the same. I don't want to stick my fingers to it. There we are. A little bit of that. A little bit of that. I say, got more time, go for epoxy. This is a nice quick project. And there we are, our TIE fire. Oh, part of a TIE fire. So there we are. I hope that's, that's given you some ideas. Ben, have we got any questions before we sign off? No, nope, there's no more questions. Um, there's a couple of people asking for links. They'll be up on the screen in, in a short moment, but I think they're actually in the description underneath. 
They are in the description. Hopefully, I've put the, the links that we've spoken about. Yeah, so the sanding table is going to be there, the sanding disc. I've also included the, um, the hook and loop, so you can make your own sanding disc as well. And just while we're talking the sanding, this is ply. Um, you could use um, MDF again, but I tend to prefer a ply. It's got a harder edge, a chamfer the edge of it, so you've got a good crisp edge right where it matters. And then you can sand around things. And in the next few weeks, what I want to do is just take this fun with the lathe a little bit further. Next week, we're going to do a mobile. So we're going to downsize the, the, the figures a little bit more. Um, and then the week after, we're going to look at things like robots, and we're going to go to fantasy figures and all that sort of stuff. Same type of turning, but just, just slightly different forms, using the same sort of processes with our sanding tables um, and just experimenting, just see what we can, we can do, really. So I really hope you enjoy that as much as I do anyway. This is sort of my type of turning. It's the sort of thing I enjoy. Um, if you did, don't forget, like we say every week, give us a thumbs up, share with your friends, subscribe to the channel if you want to see more. But until next time, guys, thanks ever so much for stopping by and watching. I've been Colin Way. Bye-bye.